All right, welcome back into another week of Whether or Not. I'm your host, meteorologist Scott Sumner. This week, we have a very special guest. The gentleman has been on our podcast before, actually just a little over a year ago. And I want to bring him back, a professor of anthropology at the Virginia Commonwealth University VCU, Dr. Bernard Means. Dr. Bernard Means, welcome back. Uh, good to have you here today. Uh, what is going on with you today? <laughs> what is going on with me today? Uh, what am I doing today? Uh, I'm playing catch up, actually. Playing from, catch up, uh, yes, indeed. Actually, all day yesterday, and then had a public event. So. Actually, that's my that's my easy intro, right? Now, now I got some yeah. questions for you. All right, um, what actually attracted you uh, to anthropology? Well, I should say, um, like when I uh, went to college, I had no idea anthropology existed, um, and so. Uh, I went to college to become a physicist because I wanted to be an astronaut, and uh, that didn't work out because it turns out I didn't like physics as much as I thought I did. Uh, so I happened to get a professor uh, who had taught a writing class, and he was an anthropologist, um, and, and what he taught was very interesting. He was a, a very nice guy, uh, good with students, and uh, so I took another class from him and decided um, I really liked his anthropology stuff. So, so that's sort of what got me into anthropology. You know, I, I did a little digging, and I found there's subgroups of anthropology. There's there's cultural, uh, linguistic, um, archaeology, and physical. Um, did you happen to specialize in one of those? And if not, which interests you the most? Um, I will say, like, as an undergraduate, I was sort of torn between uh, um, archaeology and cultural anthropology. And then when I went to graduate school, uh, they basically asked me, the, I got a teaching assistant, so they said, what do you want to do? And I'm like, uh... I remember watching Indiana Jones when I was in high school, and I said, archaeology. Uh, so that's kind of how I became an archaeologist. Um, but uh, because of the way we're trained in, in most U.S. schools, um, I did a fair amount of uh, uh, cultural anthropology and uh, biological anthropology as well. So I still kind of uh, uh, sort of move between those three realms a little bit. Um, I don't really do much in terms of the, the linguistic anthropology part. Okay. So... So saying the archaeological end of it uh, was, was the one that interested you most, uh, of course, uh, you know, with uh, uh, the movie that you mentioned, uh, which is one of my favorite movies for sure, uh, definitely. But um, having said that, so then that would lead you to kind of um, inspect or, or kind of study uh, animals, uh, I guess, to a degree, and uh, what kind of animals people would have maybe interacted with in uh, say, this general area, the D.C. area, and maybe surrounding areas about 10,000 years ago, or, or even at the end of the last Ice Age. Yeah, so that, uh, um, um, when you're talking about that time period, uh, you're starting to cross over uh, from archaeology to a little bit to paleontology, um, um, but they can overlap. So for it to be archaeology, um, uh, which, which was my original focus uh, when I started doing uh, my research in Ice Age animals, it has to have something related to people. Um, if there are no people involved at all, uh, then it falls into uh, paleontology. Uh, but 10,000 years ago, uh, people would have been around this area uh, for um, at, uh, at least three or 4,000 years, probably longer, actually. Um, we, we now think uh, uh, people have been in, in North America uh, probably for at least 20,000 years, um, which, is, which is radically different than uh, what I was taught when I went to graduate school. Uh, my, when I went to graduate school, it was about 10,000 years, and that was about it. Um, and so the kinds of animals that people would have interacted in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area uh, would include uh, some of the animals you see today, right? So uh, things like uh, uh, beavers and deer and, uh, um, and uh, you know, a lot of the smaller animals uh, um, certainly would have been around. There would have been more wolves, uh, probably more um, large cats uh, in this area. Uh, but there also would have been animals that uh, uh, no longer are extant, uh, no longer exist, um, that, that died out at, at the, in the last stage, but would have been um, quite prevalent. And so one of those animals is, uh, I have a model of one. This is a mastodon. Oh, yes. Um, these have been found in Virginia. In fact, uh, uh, there's a site in uh, um, uh, southwestern Virginia called Saltville um, that had mastodon remains. Um, and Thomas Jefferson knew about that particular site. He was actually nailed bones from that site. Uh, and there was a, also a, a major mass on um, uh, discovery found in the Yorktown area. 
uh, a nearly complete mastodon. And that mastodon dates to about 16,000 years ago. Uh, we're, we're, and may or may not have uh, been involved with interacting with people. Am I correct in um, saying? We, uh, am okay, I correct in saying that the mastodon was kind of the, uh, I don't know, forebearer of the elephant? Is that? Am I right in that thinking, or no? No. Uh, so mastodons. Uh, that's a good point. So mastodons are related to elephants, but they're very distant uh, relative to elephants. Uh, at one point in time, uh, almost every continent had some elephant-like creature, uh, but the particular mastodon I showed you is called an American mastodon. It's only found in North America, oh. so mostly in the United States, uh, some in some in Canada, uh, uh, a little bit more in uh, Mexico, uh, but you don't see uh, the this particular species of mastodon anywhere else out of North America. At the same time, and you would have had these in Virginia as well. Uh, most people are more familiar with this. These are this is a representation of a mammoth, right? Mammoths actually uh, um, are very closely related uh, to um, Asian elephants, um, and they were found uh, both in uh, the United States and Canada and Alaska, as well as uh, in uh, Asia and Europe. So they they had a much broader distribution than mastodons did. Um, and the, the big difference, uh, one of the big differences, there's a lot of differences, but the major differences people can really see are in their teeth, and their teeth reflect what they eat. So I have an actual, I happen to have an actual real uh, mammoth tooth and a real mastodon tooth. Oh, nice. Uh, so, so this is a uh, mammoth tooth. These are the, this part is the roots. Okay. It's the molar, so like right your back teeth. Okay. Um, this is the uh, chewing surface. And you can see it's like uh, um, low ridges. Yeah. And so this is just like an elephant today it would have mostly eat it, uh, mostly eaten grasses. So this is something uh, developed for grasses. Uh, and in fact, um, in the United States, the first people to recognize mass uh, mammoths as uh, elephant relatives were people enslaved from Africa oh. because they were familiar with elephants, and they correctly identified these as uh, elephant elephant-like teeth. Um, uh, the sort of the white uh, 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 slave owners thought these were the teeth of uh, giants, like giants from the Bible. <laughs> Interesting. Oh, so, that was actually not an uncommon no. thought amongst. So that was one. That's one tooth, and then that was from the mastodon. You said? No, that's from a mammoth. So mammoths are very, very closely related to elephants, and that's why their teeth look like elephant teeth. Um, the mastodon, um, and they're they're all um, they all have trunks and, and tusks. Well. Um, some of them have extra tusks, um, but uh, they're they're not that closely related to elephants, mastodons. Uh, so this is a mastodon tree. You can see it's very different. Mm. It has these bumpy, knobby teeth. Um, and in fact, uh, um, the guy who described mastodons, a French uh, French guy, uh, um, the word mastodon means breast teeth. So he thought that this looked like a bunch of breasts. Huh. Uh, and so they would have eaten like a uh, 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 hardier sort of vegetation, like uh, twigs oh. and stuff. So mastodons and mammoths are uh, um, usually are not found in the same place. Uh, they they they're usually some are in the grassy areas, and some are more in the wooded areas. Uh, but you do get overlap in some places. So Saltville, which I mentioned earlier, which is interesting, and which is very interesting, and leads me to kind of to my next question for you is you know being in the field. Uh, do you prefer field work or being in the profession? Do you prefer field work or actually do you prefer being in the lab and doing that, working in the lab? Um, I probably more prefer now being uh, um, uh, indoors. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time outside. I've spent enough time outside that uh, uh, my doctor's worried about skin cancer. <laughs> oh. uh, so uh, that's one of our hazards, especially uh, – um, uh, when when you're young, you're not so smart about sun tan lotion or hats or anything like that. Um, but uh, um, I I do get out quite a bit, um, but mostly going to different museums. So I usually end up in the back of a museum somewhere, um, and 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 get to work with collections. And so the the nice thing about working like in a museum or a laboratory setting um, is the discoveries that have already been made. Right. Um, and so you have the opportunity to sort of you know you know you can go in and ask a museum you know what's the coolest thing you have. And you know they'll get it out for you. Or the question I always ask um, is, um, you know, do you have any mastodon fossils? Um, and and a lot of museums do. So, uh, which is how I ended up uh, uh, 3D scanning this 
uh, which is a, a Macedon key that belonged to Ben Franklin, uh, which was found archaeologically in Philadelphia. So mm. um, we don't know how old the tooth is, um, and we don't quite know where it came from. Um, all of the founding fathers uh, traded uh, um, uh, in Macedon bones in particular. They're fascinated with Macedon. So, so, so when you're out in the field and have been out in the field in the past, and you you come across and through a dig and you and you find a fossil, um, what what are the steps? I mean, because you know, obviously, you, I've seen them in movies and stuff. Just stay away. You get the little brush out there and you start delicately moving the dirt because you don't want to disturb certain things. Is 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 what I've seen in movies and, and what people see in movies kind of truly related to field work out there in your profession? Um, it kind of depends. So, like, as an archaeologist, I wouldn't normally find fossils. I'd find artifacts. Right. Um, if I if I find a fossil, it means that somebody in the past uh, collected that fossil. So, like, I, I actually have a fossil megalodon tooth found uh, in an enslaved context in Virginia. So the fossil is millions of years old, well older than uh, any people would have been here in, in Virginia. But some enslaved person found it and collected it. So then it becomes an artifact of found with people. But yeah, so to get your question about excavating, uh, we do use brushes and stuff, um, but depending on where you are, and, and, and this is certainly true in Virginia, uh, you might also use a pickaxe. Uh, you might use a shovel. You know, um, uh, Sometimes the soil is really hard to get through. So um, to get to the layer where the artifacts are, you might use sort of heavier equipment. And then we use uh, um, trowels, uh, um, kind of like a, a like a masonry trowel mm -hmm. for scraping. And then once we've uncovered things, we might use brushes um, to, to sort of sort of clean up uh, the object. Um, we don't usually do the final cleaning of an object in the field um, because you can damage an object. Um, usually it gets sent back into a laboratory and, that, and then gets further processed, further cleaned up and whatnot. Uh, being in the D.C. area now and talking to you from the D.C. studios, people might, you know, watching this might be curious, okay, well, what have you found here locally? What, uh, where have there been digs locally, maybe let's say within a radius of 100 miles from D.C.'s center? Um, everywhere. Everywhere. is it? So, Everywhere. Yeah. So, uh, so, like, uh, within D.C. proper, actually, mm -hmm. in uh, Rock Creek Park, uh, there are some significant American uh, Indian uh, quarry sites where they would have quarried for stone uh, material to make uh, stone tools. And there's also actually a relatively uh, localized uh, stone called steatite that they would have carved stone bowls out. Uh, so that's in the D.C. area itself. Uh, we also have more recent archaeology in D.C., um, uh, so what we call historical archaeology, historic period archaeology. Um, so, for example, I was involved with... Uh, um, 3D scan and artifacts that were archaeologically recovered from Frederick Douglass's house uh, in Anacostia. So, so archaeology can cover all, all kinds of time periods, and there are uh, plenty of uh, major American Indian villages, especially up and down the Potomac River. Um, there would have been some major villages, uh, including some that uh, would have been encountered by uh, um, John Smith and, and mm -hmm. sort of his sort of traveling around the area, and, and of course other people as well. And you have to have, a, obviously, a permit to dig. I mean, you can't just randomly go out and start digging up the land to try and find stuff, I'm sure, right? Um, no, well, um, anybody can dig anywhere if they have permission. Um, there are exceptions. Uh, so uh, the only, and it, it sort of depends on the locality. Like in, uh, some cities or localities have uh, archaeology ordinances. So like the city of Alexandria has an archaeology ordinance. You can't just dig anywhere you feel like. Other places don't have that. Uh, the main limitation uh, where you would need a permit uh, usually is uh, if there's uh, uh, graves involved, whether right. indigenous graves or more recent graves, and then, then you would need a, a permit. But if, if you're digging on somebody's private property, um, you don't necessarily need a permit. Um, but people who don't like sort of follow the sort of the official rules or official protocols are not not really what we would call archaeologists. They're, right. they're people who are digging and they're finding stuff, but they're not doing it in a way that is carefully recording what they found. And, and just to take it one step further, then I'll have the last question. If, by chance, you bring up another point here, someone goes digging and they actually possibly even stumble upon something, what would their step be? Would they call? Who would they call or speak with to say, hey, look, I found such and such. Come out and check it out. 
Um, that would that would sort of depend on where you live. Um, so each uh, state in the District of Columbia have a, a, a um, uh, they're called uh, historic preservation officers. They have an office where that manages sort of the cultural resources uh, within that uh, city or within that state. And so you would call one of them up. And uh, they may then for you know reference you to somebody else. So, for example, uh, the state of Virginia has what are called regional archaeologists. Um, there are three of them. Uh, there's one based in Richmond, one based in Northern Virginia, and one based in southwestern Virginia. Um, and so, if you have an archaeological discovery, um, you would probably contact one of those. Um, if you're in D.C. proper, you would call the office of a D.C. archaeologist, um, and they um, may or may not be able to actually come out. See what you're doing, and then in Maryland, um, uh, there's something called the Maryland Historical Trust, um, and and their office would be the one to sort of put you in touch with um, with with an archaeologist. Okay, so that that covers the the the, the people out there who are thinking, you know, like, hey, I, maybe I want to dig for something. But yourself, someone who's been in the field here, what is uh, last question? What has been your greatest accomplishment uh, in your field? Would you say? Uh, what has been my greatest accomplishment in my field? Uh, this is going to sound kind of trite, I guess, but um, um, I really like working with students, um, and so I feel accomplished when they accomplish things. So in teaching, basically, yeah. Teaching, yeah. I really like teaching. Absolutely. Uh, and I do uh, what's called experiential learning, so it's very hands-on. So like you can see all the stuff behind me. That's all the stuff that I've done uh, with students. And you, I was going to say, do you take the students out on a trip, uh, like a day trip, a field trip of some sort? at some point in your, in your class uh, to, to do stuff? Um, when I can. Uh, uh, students have very busy schedules, uh, which don't always coincide. But when I can, I take students with me. So uh, we've, you know, I've taken students to uh, Colonial Williamsburg. I've taken students up to uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, um, and, and other localities. And so those, those can be overnight trips. Um, I'm actually working on a project right now that I uh, will probably take a couple of students with me to Hawaii next year. Oh. <laughs> You're talking my language. Love Hawaii. <laughs> Great. In May. I'm sure Hawaii is horrible in May. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's terrible. Rains every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Not, so. not any good. Hey, well, thanks so much for taking a few minutes of your time and, and uh, you know, bringing up the Indiana Jones reference, which I love, one of my favorite movies. And uh, and it's, it's an interesting subject that fascinated me. A lot of kids growing up, at least a lot of boys growing up, uh, certainly uh, enjoyed dinosaurs when they were kids and learning about that. And so I wanted to bring you on board and talk a little bit about it. And thank you for showing the, uh, the fossils there that you have the, the tooth. Um, that was great. So I'm sure people will, will enjoy that. Uh, Dr. Bernard Means here from VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University. Thank you so much for taking a few minutes of your time. Have a great week, and we'll maybe chat around again next year. Cool. Thank you very much. All right. Take nice care. Nice talking to you. <laughs> well, that wraps it up here for another week of Weather or Not. I'm your host, meteorologist Scott Sumner. As always, be well, stay safe, God bless, and we'll talk again next week. Bye-bye now. Okay. All good? Yes, all good.